Hello, I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence and algorithms this week. Hugo, my pup, may well join in. He's been barking at dogs outside, but uh, if he does, I'll try and keep him quiet. I want to talk about the various levels of artificial intelligence. I mean, we're using artificial intelligence all the time now. We're surrounded by artificial intelligence. Most of it is fairly mundane, quite simple kind of stuff nothing terribly sophisticated um, but very effective the first level of artificial intelligence is if you like is that which works on supervised structured data and by this I mean we give the AI the basic categories it needs and then it sees whether those fit into it so we say divide the world into oranges and apples and we give it pictures of oranges and apples and so on, it will divide them up appropriately. We have, if we give it enough information about what is an orange and what an orange looks like and an apple and what that looks like and so on. So, you know, with apples, you have to say, well, it could be red, they could be green, they could be mixed, they could be big, they could be small, and the same with oranges. It, you know, we, do we want it to distinguish between tangerines, clementines and oranges, or do we just want, say, all orange-shaped fruit, probably including Donald Trump, are oranges? I don't know. Um, but that's the way that gets trained. That kind of artificial intelligence is something you often see when you go on websites, uh, maybe Bunnings or one of those, and you're buying something, and a little bubble pops up, can I help you? Um, and you type in request and so on, and that's working on a predefined set of categories that will look to see keywords in what you ask it to be able to give you answers which means the answers are going to be very hit and miss. Uh, um, they might not do that, uh, uh, might not give you what you want, but you know, they might do it at the same time. So, so it's a quick, cheap, and fairly easy way to do it. You often uh, um, come across this on uh, uh, bank websites and bank um, phone-in apps as well. You know, When you call in and it says you have a menu choice and it's giving you different menus to go behind it. It's asking for information. It may ask you for your date of birth. It may ask you for your card number or something like that in an attempt to direct you into predefined categories or you need this department or that department and so on, which may or may not work. And then of course, you know, wait till a, a human comes on. Uh, and very often you can give it all the information and it will send you to a human anyway. So those are kinds of very basic uh, uh, um, AI, if you like, and that is around us day in, day out. Your car probably has very basic AI in it. It's constantly evaluating whether your braking system is working, whether the oil system is working, um, whether the filtration system is working. All of these are, are based around very simple AI, along with chatbots, which I've mentioned that you find on websites and things like that. Some chatbots are more sophisticated than others, but most of them are fairly simple level. Um, the next level is more unstructured and unsupervised learning. And this is where we're asking AI to um, take, if you like, more difficult decisions to incorporate more data into what it's doing uh, uh, and come up with uh, um, better and more uh, um, targeted solutions so uh, um, you know we if we want it, uh, uh, a facial recognition system for example which we find in many cities now as you walk along and you see the CCTV up on the lamppost there or you see uh, um, number plate recognition systems again cameras up there so all, all the data all you know numbers are, are fed into a system and the camera looks down and it can pick out the appropriate one um, but it can distinguish between different kinds of script and, and things like that. It may even be able to look underneath dirt and find out what the number is too. But with faces, uh, we're dealing with a much more uh, a broader range. So um, we want it to be able to recognize uh, uh, the general population of faces, which these days is quite uh, uh, diverse. You know, male, female faces, which are often different shapes and so on. Uh, um, 
we have a, a, um, a, a, a different hair colors gray for example uh, black blonde uh, uh, and various other colors eye colors minor brown they, people could have blue uh, uh, big lips small lips one nose preferably two eyes two ears but of course that would have to vary depending on which way it's looking at people are they side on to the camera are they full on to the camera and things like this so we are dealing with um, a whole range of, uh, uh, of little bits of data and then of course we have um, different ethnic groups uh, 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 are you um, of Indian origin for example are you uh, uh, indigenous person uh, uh, are you Ugandan are you Nigerian uh, um, can it tell those kinds of differences uh, uh, we don't know can it work with beards uh, uh, without beards mustaches uh, uh, long hair short hair uh, uh, all of those sorts of things um, it will need to contend with if you like and not just the difference say between white and black but also you know between Ugandans and Nigerians West Africans are very different from East Africans in their appearance and looks and so forth. So it, we need it to be able to understand all of these things. We know that it doesn't do it very well at the moment. But this is part of the training thing. With a system like that, artificial intelligence needs as much data as you can give it to train on. So for facial recognition, we need millions and millions and millions of photographs pictures of faces most of these as you probably realize are scraped from the internet uh, um, the companies that do this will scrape from Facebook they will scrape from Instagram snapchat Twitter anything they can get their holds on websites uh, 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 what they can grab they they will take in order to train the algorithm you can never train it enough the more I'm, and so it's a constant process of training and I think I may have mentioned to you before but uh, um, some companies like Tencent in China one of the big uh, um, tech companies there is well it's not the only one but it's the one I know about at the moment is trying to train uh, uh, artificial recognition to um, evaluate and understand different emotions on the face you know, happy sad angry you know and so on I think I've said this before but that is more difficult because uh, um, somebody crying can often look like somebody who is angry um, so emotions are not so clear-cut in the ways that facial differences might be my face for example is quite square some people have you know oval shaped faces some people have heart shaped faces you know and it has to uh, uh, deal with those so let me look at a, 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 um, another category which is probably easier to understand um, board games board games have been a, a, a subject of AI training ever since uh, the Second World War so if we go back to the 1950s thereabouts um, IBM engineers began to think well can we train a computer to play drafts well, they would have said checkers of course but uh, I'll call it drafts because that's the name I know about now drafts is a fairly straightforward quite simple game you have a board which is eight by eight squares uh, um, you have two sides black pieces white pieces but they all look the same they're all just a little disc now you can double up you can go from one disc high to do this two disc high as you take pieces to the other end and back and so on but those are fairly simple rules to incorporate uh, um, for the AI to learn and to be able to play and because of the relatively limited numbers of moves and so on in a game of drafts um, a computer can basically uh, calculate all the permutations all the combinations of moves that can be made at only one moment and go ahead and play um, that's not too difficult the next stage which was a lot more difficult but still doable um, was to see whether it could play chess now again we have a board that's eight by eight squares so 64 squares in total um, so we've got the limit there if you like but the pieces are now different in the ways that the drafts pieces were not so we've got white and black sides again but they're identical we each have the same kinds of pieces we all know that the front row of our pieces 
are pawns. They all do the same thing. They don't vary. They do have slight oddities. En passant will be coming another piece when it gets to the other end and so on. Um, all right, but you know, that's... Uh, and they take on a diagonal, not going ahead. But anyway, those those are rules that we can we can cope with quite easily. And then at the back row, uh, the pieces are quite different. You know, we've got the queen who can move anywhere, the king who can sort of move anywhere, but only one square at a time. And then we've got you know the bishops which can only move on the diagonals, uh, uh, the knights that move in a strange L shape kind of way, and uh, um, the uh, uh, castles that move as it were, horizontally and, and vertically, if you like. I'll call it that on the board. Now, IBM Watson Big Blue, which was the computer that was designed to play chess against people like Kasparov, the Russian grandmaster, and so on, um, was trained on as many chess games as known. Now, of course, chess has kept a big record of, of its games. You can buy books uh, um, with games in them. You can study particular moves. There are openings. There are middle games. There are end games. There is a lot of data about chess because people are just obsessive about recording every move. If you ever watch that Netflix series, The Queen's Gambit, um, you'll see that going on as everybody's watching and writing down the moves in, in their little notebooks and so on. So um, again, it would take longer. You need a much more powerful computer, uh, uh, a lot of data, which you have with chess, to train it to play chess. And of course, IBM Watson Blue became quite successful at that because uh, uh, eventually it was able to uh, um, beat the humans in this game. Now the next step, this is the really, really difficult one in a way. Now we go to the game of Go. Now Go is an Asian game, anywhere two and a half to 3,000 years old. Strong established culture. Um, but much, much more complicated than, than chess. For a start, the board is 19 by 19 squares. It can be smaller, but we'll go for the, the biggest, the maximum board. Um, you don't play on the squares. You play on the intersections of lines that form the squares. Each side has identical pieces, uh, little stones they're called, um, one side's white, one side's black. And the idea is you put your uh, 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 stone down on the intersection of the lines and try and capture as much territory as possible, at the same time avoiding being captured yourself by the other side. Um, this is a, 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 a can be, the game can go on for a long, long time. Um, as I say, it has a very established culture. But the numbers of potential moves at that level are far too great just to say, all right, we'll calculate each one as we come across it. It will take years to play a game. So that's, that's not on. So what we have to do with uh, um, the game of Go is to basically give the algorithm the essential rules, of which there are basically two, how to move and what you're trying to do, and then let it play. Uh, um, and just let it play and let it play and let it play and you reinforce it every time it makes the right move or wins a game it's reinforced I am doing the right kind of thing every time it loses or makes a wrong move there's a kind of negative reinforcement and it learns from that I don't do that again don't do that avoid that and so on and gradually it builds up this kind of library of expertise knowing how to deal with, with various situations. So that when it came to play the Korean Grand Masters, it didn't win all the games, um, but it won a number of them. And then, as I think I may have said before, it actually then started playing in a way that humans had not seen before. It started making moves that, to a human, who understood the 3,000 years of Go culture, this move just didn't make sense. It didn't compute. It would not be found in the commentaries and, and, and folklore of the game. It just didn't make sense. In the computer's mind, in the algorithm's mind, it made a lot of sense because the algorithm was thinking 20 moves down the way, that particular move I've done there is then going to be very significant as to what happens next. Now, you know, people are thinking ahead all the time, but... What it meant was that 
by the time Go had been successfully taught, uh, AlphaGo had been successfully taught how to play Go, um, humans didn't want to play with it. It wasn't playing a game they recognized anymore in that way. Now, um, the, the algorithm has been used for other things. Um, we'll come across a couple of them when we're talking about um, technology and health. Uh, uh, it's been used to um, uh, analyze data on medical conditions. Um, and it's also being used to help science. Now, one of the most complicated things to be able to do is to understand how a protein is going to fold. Now, a protein is a basic building block of our, our cells, um, and proteins have all kinds of uh, properties. Um, and in certain conditions, proteins fold in on themselves. Uh, uh, and when they do that, we can see what's happening. We know how it's doing. What we want to be able to do is to predict how a protein is going to fold. And then this would mean that in terms of medicine anyway, we can then target vaccines and other things more precisely than we could. However, it's not just a case of doing a little bit of origami and, and coming up with a nice little boat that can be sailed on the water or a little bird that will fly in that way. It's far more complex than that. And so um, uh, DeepMind, the company that built AlphaGo, um, built uh, DeepFold, AlphaFold, I think it was called, and entered us into a competition to see you know, how proteins could be folded. And it did very well. It came, you know, it, it, it was as good as, if not in some cases, better than humans. So we are at the point where very complex things can now be done uh, uh, by artificial intelligence in ways that we couldn't be done before. We are going to see more and more of this. Um, we are going to uh, encounter it in ways, but we also see ways in which it can go horribly wrong. There is, at the very moment, as I am speaking, which is on the 13th of November, 12th of November, um, a Royal Commission looking at the robo-debt scandal. This is where people on welfare were suddenly hit with enormous bills which they were expected to pay. Um, the burden of proof was reversed. People who were told they'd been overpaid welfare or, or under, um, uh, 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 or shall I say, didn't say how much they were earning in other places and so on, were, were hit with these debts which they had to pay off immediately. It drove some people to suicide. It drove other people into horrible mental health problems and so on. All of that was run by AI. The problem with that was that it was trained very, very badly. The algorithm was not trained very properly. So, for example, uh, uh, people on welfare receive payments, I believe, on a fortnightly basis, two-weekly basis. But the AI was being trained on annual data, annual payments data, which doesn't necessarily break down easily into two-week periods, just because you can say, oh, well, divide it by 26, and we know what we are. But there are all sorts of things that happen. They're not comparable chunks of data. And... Uh, um, and so it made lots of errors. It was bound to make errors. And, um, and unfortunately, the civil servants and the ministers who were running it knew that it was making errors, but would not say anything. They just let it carry on. Partly that was because of a cultural, political attitude said that we should take a punitive attitude towards welfare recipients. Not the best approach, you know, uh, 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 um, a caring society. Let's punish people who are worse off uh, uh, than we are for whatever reason. It could be disability, uh, um, it could be mental illness, it could be physical illness, it could be all sorts of things in that way. So it's not, and I, I suspect, you know, we, 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 we will learn more and more about that as the Royal Commission proceeds along the way. Well, uh, um, I think that's as much as I want to say about algorithms and, and artificial intelligence at the moment. The Royal Society literature I've given you is very easy to read. Uh, you can, there are bite-sized chunks for you to read there. You can look at the whole report on machine learning and AI, for example, which I think um, you would like enjoy reading. 
and um, I'll see you next week. Bye.